Chapter 22 Position of the Reformers Concerning the Sabbath and First Day The Great Reformation of the 16th century arose from the bosom of the Catholic Church itself. From that Church the Sabbath had long been extirpated, and instead of that merciful institution ordained by the Divine Lawgiver for the rest and refreshment of mankind, and that man might acknowledge God as his Creator, the papacy had ordained innumerable festivals, which, as a terrible burden, crushed the people to the earth. These festivals are thus enumerated by Dr. Halen. Quote, These holy days, as they were named particularly in Pope Gregory's Decretal, so was a perfect list made of them in the Synod of Leon, A.D. 1244, which being celebrated with a great concourse of people from all parts of Christendom, the canons and decrees thereof began forthwith to find a general admittance. The holy days allowed of there were these that follow, the Feast of Christ's Nativity, St. Stephen, St. John the Evangelist, the Innocents, St. Sylvester, the Circumcision of Our Lord, the Epiphany, Easter, together with the week precedent, and the week succeeding the three days in Rogation Week, the day of Christ's Ascension, Whit Sunday, with the two days after, St. John the Baptist, the feasts of all the Twelve Apostles, all the festivities of Our Lady, St. Lawrence, all the Lord's days in the year, St. Michael the Archangel, all saints, St. Martin's, the wakes, or dedication of particular churches, together with the feasts of such topical or local saints which some particular people had been pleased to honor with a day particular amongst themselves. On these and every one of them, the people were restrained, as before was said, from many several kinds of work, on pain of ecclesiastical censors to be laid on them which did offend, unless on some emergent causes, either of charity or necessity, they were dispensed with for so doing. Peter de Aliaco, Cardinal of Cambrai, in the discourse by him exhibited to the Council of Constance, A.D. 1416, made public suit unto the fathers there assembled, that there might be a stop in that kind hereafter, as also that, excepting Sundays and the greater festivals, it might be lawful for the people after the end of divine service to attend their business, the poor especially, as having little time enough on the working days to get their living. But these were only the expressions of well-wishing men. The popes were otherwise resolved, and did not only keep the holy days which they found established, in the same state in which they found them, but added others daily as they saw occasion. Thus stood it, as before I said, both for the doctrine and the practice, till men began to look into the errors and abuses in the Roman Church with a more serious eye than before they did. Close quote. Such was the state of things when the Reformers began their labors, that they should give up these festivals and return to the observance of the ancient Sabbath would be expecting too much of men educated in the bosom of the Romish Church. Indeed, it ought not to surprise us that, while they were constrained to strike down the authority of these festivals, they should nevertheless retain the most important of them in their observance. The Reformers spoke on this matter as follows. The Confession of the Swiss Churches declares that, quote, The observance of the Lord's Day is founded not on any commandment of God, but on the authority of the Church, and that the Church may alter the day at pleasure. Close quote. We further learn that, quote, in the Augsburg Confession, which was drawn up by Melanchthon and approved by Luther, to the question, What ought we to think of the Lord's Day? it is answered that the Lord's Day, Easter, Wits, Suntide, and other such holy days, ought to be kept because they are appointed by the Church, that all things may be done in order but that the observance of them is not to be thought necessary to salvation, nor the violation of them if it be done without offense to others, 
to be regarded as a sin. Close quote. Zwingli declared quote, that it was lawful on the Lord's day after divine service for any man to pursue his labors. Close quote. Biza taught that quote, no cessation of work on the Lord's day is required of Christians. Close quote. Busser goes further yet, quote, and doth not only call it a superstition, but an apostasy from Christ, to think that working on the Lord's day in itself considered is a sinful thing, close quote. And Cranmer, in his catechism published in 1548, says, quote, We now keep no more the Sabbath on Saturday as the Jews do, but we observe the Sunday and certain other days as the magistrates do judge convenient, whom in this thing we ought to obey. Close quote. Tyndale said, quote, As for the Sabbath, we be lords over the Sabbath, and may yet change it into Monday, or into any other day as we see need, or may make every tenth day holy day only if we see cause why. Close quote. It is plain that both Cranmer and Tyndale believed that the ancient Sabbath was abolished, and that Sunday was only a human ordinance which it was in the power of the magistrates and the church lawfully to change whenever they saw cause for so doing. And Dr. Hesse gives the opinion of Zwingli respecting the present power of each individual church to transfer the so-called Lord's Day to another day whenever necessity urges, as, for example, in harvest time. Thus Zwingli says, quote, if we would have the Lord's day so bound to time that it shall be wickedness to transfer it to another time, in which resting from our labors equally as in that we may hear the word of God, if necessity haply shall so require, this day so solicitously observed would obtrude on us as a ceremony. For we are no way bound to time, but time ought so to serve us, that it is lawful, and permitted to each church, when necessity urges, as is usual to be done in harvest time, to transfer the solemnity and rest of the Lord's day or Sabbath to some other day. Close quote. Zwingli could not, therefore, have considered Sunday as a divinely appointed memorial of the resurrection, or indeed as anything but a church festival. John Calvin said respecting the origin of the Sunday festival, quote, However, the ancients have not without sufficient reason substituted that we call the Lord's day in the room of the Sabbath. For since the resurrection of the Lord is the end and consummation of that true rest, which was adumbrated by the ancient Sabbath, the same day which put an end to the shadows, admonishes Christians not to adhere to a shadowy ceremony. Yet I do not lay so much stress on the septenary number that I would oblige the church to an invariable adherence to it. Nor will I condemn those churches which have other solemn days for their assemblies, provided they keep at a distance from superstition. Close quote. It is worthy of notice that Calvin does not assign to Christ and his disciples the establishment of Sunday in the place of the Sabbath. He says this was done by the ancients, or as another translates it, the old fathers. Nor does he say, the day which John called the Lord's day, but the day which we call the Lord's day. And what is worthy of particular notice, he did not insist that the day which should be appropriated to worship should be one day in every seven, for he was not tied to, quote, the septenary number, close quote. The day might come once in six days or once in eight, and this proves conclusively that he did not regard Sunday as a divine institution in the proper sense of the word. For if he had, he would most assuredly have felt that the festival must be septenary, that is, weekly, and that he must urge the church to an invariable adherence to it. But Calvin does not leave the matter here. He condemns as, quote, false prophets, close quote, those who attempt to enforce the Sunday festival by means of the fourth commandment, 
and who to do this say that the ceremonial part, which requires the observance of the definite seventh day, is abolished, while the moral part, which simply commands the observance of one day and seven, still remains in force. Here are his words. Quote, Thus vanish all the dreams of false prophets, who in past ages have infected the people with a Jewish notion, affirming that nothing but the ceremonial part of the commandment, which according to them is the appointment of the seventh day, has been abrogated, but that the moral part of it, that is, the observance of one day in seven, still remains. But this is only changing the day in contempt of the Jews, while they retain the same opinion of the holiness of a day. Close quote. Yet these very, quote, dreams of false prophets, close quote, to use the words of Calvin, constitute the foundation of the modern doctrine of the change of the Sabbath. For whatever may be said of first-day sacredness in the New Testament, the fourth commandment can only be made to recognize that day by means of this very doctrine of one day in seven, which Calvin so sharply denounces. Now I state another important fact. Calvin's commentaries on the New Testament cover all the books from which quotations are made in behalf of Sunday, except the book of Revelation. What does Calvin say concerning the change of the Sabbath in the record of Christ's resurrection? Not one word. He does not even hint at any sacredness in the day, nor any commemoration of the day. Does he say that the meeting after eight days was upon Sunday? He does not say what day it was. What does he say of Sunday in treating of the day of Pentecost? Nothing. He does not so much as say that this festival was on the first day of the week. What does he say of the breaking of bread at Troas? He thinks it took place upon the ancient Sabbath. He says, quote, Either he doth mean the first day of the week, which was next after the Sabbath, or else some certain Sabbath, which latter thing may seem to me more probable for this cause, because that day was more fit for an assembly according to custom. Close quote. He says, however, that this place might very well be translated, quote, the morrow after the Sabbath, close quote. but he adheres to his own translation, one day of the Sabbaths, and not first day of the week. He says further, quote, For to what end is there mentioned of the Sabbath, save only that he may note the opportunity and choice of the time? Also, it is a likely matter that Paul waited for the Sabbath, that the day before his departure he might the more easily gather all the disciples into one place. Therefore, I think thus, that they had appointed a solemn day for the celebrating of the Holy Supper of the Lord among themselves, which might be commodious for them all. This shows conclusively that Calvin believed the Sabbath, and not the first day of the week, to have been the day for meetings in the apostolic church. But what does he say of the laying by in store on the first day of the week? He says that Paul's precept relates not to the first day of the week, but to the Sabbath. And he marks the Sabbath as the day on which the sacred assemblies were held and the communion celebrated, and says that on account of these things this was the most convenient day for collecting their contribution. Thus he writes, quote, On one of the Sabbaths. The end is this, that they may have their alms ready in time. He therefore exhorts them not to wait till he came, as anything that is done suddenly and in a bustle is not done well, but to contribute on the Sabbath what might seem good, and according as every one's ability might enable, that is, on the day on which they held their sacred assemblies. For he has an eye, first of all, to convenience, and farther, that the sacred assembly, in which the communion of saints is celebrated, might be an additional spur to them. Nor am I inclined to admit the view taken by Chrysostom, that the term Sabbath is employed here to mean the Lord's Day, Revelation 1, verse 10. For the probability is that the apostles, at the beginning, retained the day that was already in use, 
but that afterwards, constrained by the superstition of the Jews, they set aside that day and substituted another. Now the Lord's day was made choice of, chiefly because our Lord's resurrection put an end to the shadows of the law. Hence the day itself puts us in mind of our Christian liberty. Close quote. These words are very remarkable. They show first that by the Sabbath day Calvin means not the first day, but the seventh. Second, that in his judgment as late as the time of this epistle and of the meeting at Troas, A.D. 60, the Sabbath was the day for the sacred assemblies of the Christians and for the celebration of the communion. Third, but that afterwards, constrained by the superstition of the Jews, they set aside that day and substituted another. Calvin did not therefore believe that Christ changed the Sabbath to Sunday to commemorate his resurrection, for he says that the resurrection abolished the Sabbath, and yet he believes that the Sabbath was the sacred day of the Christians to the entire exclusion of Sunday as late as the year 60. Nor could he believe that the apostles set apart Sunday to commemorate the resurrection of Christ, for he thinks that they did not make choice of that day till after the year 60, and even then they did it merely because constrained so to do by the superstition of the Jews. Dr. Hesse illustrates Calvin's ideas of Sunday observance by the following incident. Quote, Knox was the intimate friend of Calvin, visited Calvin, and it is said on one occasion found him enjoying the recreation of bulls on Sunday. Close quote. Without doubt, Calvin was acting in exact harmony with his ideas of the nature of the Sunday festival. But the famous case of Michael Servetus furnishes us a still more pointed illustration of his views of the sacredness of that day. Servetus was arrested in Geneva on the personal application of John Calvin to the magistrates of that city. Such is the statement of Theodore Beza, the lifelong friend of Calvin. Beza's translator adds to this fact the following remarkable statement, quote, Promptness induced him to have this heresy arch arrested on a Sunday, close quote. The same fact is stated by Robinson, quote, While he waited for a boat to cross the lake in his way to Zurich, by some means Calvin got intelligence of his arrival, and although it was on a Sunday, yet he prevailed upon the chief syndic to arrest and imprison him. On that day, by the laws of Geneva, no person could be arrested except for a capital crime. But this difficulty was easily removed, for John Calvin pretended that Servetus was a heretic, and that heresy was a capital crime. The doctor was arrested and imprisoned on Sunday, the 13th of August, A.D. 1553. That very day he was brought into court. Close quote. Calvin's own words respecting the arrest are these, quote, I will not deny but that he was made prisoner upon my application, close quote. The warmest friends of first-day sacredness will not deny that the least sinful part of this transaction was that it occurred on Sunday. Nevertheless, the fact that Calvin caused the arrest of Servetus on that day shows that he had no conviction that the day possessed any inherent sacredness. John Barclay, a learned man of Scotch descent, and a moderate Roman Catholic, who was born soon after the death of Calvin, and whose early life was spent in eastern France, not very remote from Geneva, published the statement that Calvin and his friends at Geneva, quote, debated whether the Reformed, for the purpose of estranging themselves more completely from the Romish Church, should not adopt Thursday as the Christian Sabbath. Close quote. Another reason assigned by Calvin for this proposed change was quote, that it would be a proper instance of Christian liberty. Close quote. This statement has been credited by many learned Protestants, some of whom must be acknowledged as men of candor and judgment. But Dr. Twiss discredits Barclay because he did not name the individuals with whom Calvin consulted and produced them as witnesses, 
and because that King James I of England at one time suspected Barclay of treachery toward him. But no such crime was ever proved, nor does it appear that the king continued always to hold him in that light. His veracity has never been impeached. The statement of Barclay may possibly be incorrect, but it is not inconsistent with Calvin's doctrine that the church is not tied to a festival that should come once in seven days, even as Tyndale said that they could change the Sabbath into Monday, or could, quote, make every tenth day holy day, only if we see cause why, close quote. And it is in perfect harmony with Calvin's idea of Sunday sacredness, as shown in his acts already noticed. Like the other reformers, Calvin is not always consistent with himself in his statements. Nevertheless, we have his judgment concerning the several texts which are used to prove the change of the Sabbath, and also respecting the theory that the commandment may be used to enforce not the seventh day, but one day in seven, and it is fatal to the modern first-day doctrine. John Knox, the great Scottish reformer, was the intimate friend of Calvin, with whom he lived at Geneva during a portion of his exile from Scotland. Though the foundation of the Presbyterian Church of Scotland was laid by Knox, or rather by Calvin, for Knox carried out Calvin's system, and though that church is now very strict in the observance of Sunday as the Sabbath, yet Knox himself was of Calvin's mind as to the obligation of that day. The original confession of faith of that church was drawn up by Knox in A.D. 1560. In that document, Knox states the duties of the first table of the law as follows, quote, To have one God, to worship and honor Him, to call upon Him in all our troubles, to reverence His holy name, to hear His word, to believe the same, to communicate with His holy sacraments, are the works of the first table. It is plain that Knox believed the Sabbath commandment to have been stricken out of the first table. Dr. Hesse, after speaking of certain references to Sunday in a subsequent work of his, makes this statement respecting the present doctrine of the Sabbath in the Presbyterian Church. Quote, On the whole, whatever the language held at present in Scotland may be, it is certainly not owing to the great man whom the Scotch regard as the apostle of the Reformation in their country. Close quote. That church now holds Sunday to be the divinely authorized memorial of the resurrection of Christ, enforced by the authority of the fourth commandment. But not thus was it held by Calvin and Knox. A British writer states the condition of things with respect to Sunday in Scotland about the year 1601. Quote, At the commencement of the 17th century, tailors, shoemakers, and bakers in Aberdeen were accustomed to work till eight or nine every Sunday morning. While violation of the prescribed ritual observances was punished by fine, the exclusive consecration of the Sunday, which subsequently prevailed, was then unknown. Indeed, there were regular play Sundays in Scotland till the end of the 16th century. Close quote. But the Presbyterian Church, after Knox's time, effected an entire change with respect to Sunday observance. The same writer says, quote, the Presbyterian Kirk introduced into Scotland the Judaical observance of the Sabbath, in brackets it says Sunday, retaining with some inconsistency the Sunday festival of the Catholic Church, while rejecting all the other feasts which its authority had consecrated. Close quote. Dr. Hesse shows the method of doing this. He says, quote, Of course some difficulties had to be got over, the Sabbath was the seventh day, Sunday was the first day of the week, but an ingenious theory that one day in seven was the essence of the fourth commandment speedily reconciled them to this. Close quote. The circumstances under which this new doctrine was framed, the name of its author, and the date of its publication will be given in their place. That the body of the Reformers should have failed to recognize the authority of the Fourth Commandment, 
and that they did not turn men from the Romish festivals to the Sabbath of the Lord is a matter of regret rather than of surprise. The impropriety of making them the standard of divine truth is forcibly set forth in the following language. Quote, Luther and Calvin reformed many abuses, especially in the discipline of the church, and also some gross corruptions in doctrine. But they left other things of far greater moment just as they found them. It was great merit in them to go as far as they did. And it is not they, but we, who are to blame if their authority induce us to go no further. We should rather imitate them in the boldness and spirit with which they called in question and rectified so many long-established errors, and availing ourselves of their labors, make further progress than they were able to do. Little reason have we to allege their name, authority, and example when they did a great deal and we do nothing at all. In this we are not imitating them, but those who opposed and counteracted them, willing to keep things as they were. Close quote. Chapter 23 Luther and Karlstadt It is worthy of notice that at least one of the reformers of considerable prominence, Karlstadt, was a Sabbatarian. It is impossible to read the records of the Reformation without the conviction that Karlstadt was desirous of a more thorough work of Reformation than was Luther, and that while Luther was disposed to tolerate certain abuses lest the Reformation should be endangered, Karlstadt was at all hazards for a complete return to the Holy Scriptures. The Sabbatarian principles of Karlstadt, his intimate connection with Luther, his prominence in the early history of the Reformation, and the important bearing of Luther's decision concerning the Sabbath upon the entire history of the Protestant Church, render the former worthy of notice in the history of the Sabbath. We shall give his record in the exact words of the best historians, none of whom were in sympathy with his observance of the seventh day. The manner in which they state his faults show that they were not partial toward him, Shortly after Luther began to preach against the merits of good works, his deep interest in the work of delivering men from popish thraldom led him to deny the inspiration of some portion of those scriptures which were quoted against him. Dr. Sears thus states the case, quote, Luther was so zealous to maintain the doctrine of justification by faith that he was prepared even to call in question the authority of some portions of Scripture which seemed to him not to be reconcilable with it. To the epistle of James especially, his expressions indicate the strongest repugnance. Before Luther's captivity in the castle of Wartburg, a dispute had arisen between himself and Karlstadt on this very subject. It is recorded of Karlstadt that in the year 1520, quote, he published a treatise concerning the canon of Scripture, which, although defaced by bitter attacks on Luther, was nevertheless an able work, setting forth the great principle of Protestantism, that is, the paramount authority of Scripture. He also at this time contended for the authority of the Epistle of St. James against Luther, on the publication of a bull of Leo X against the Reformers, Karlstadt showed a real and honest courage in standing firm with Luther. His work on Papal Sanctity, 1520, attacks the infallibility of the Pope on the basis of the Bible. Close quote. Luther, as is well known, while returning from the Diet of Worms, was seized by the agents of the Elector of Saxony, and hidden from his enemies in Wartburg Castle. We read of Karlstadt at this time as follows, quote, In 1521, during Luther's confinement in the Wartburg, Karlstadt had almost sole control of the reform movement at Wittenberg, and was supreme in the university. He attacked monachism and celibacy in a treatise entitled 
concerning celibacy, monachism, and widowhood. His next point of assault was the Mass, and a riot of students and young citizens against the Mass soon followed. On Christmas 1521, he gave the sacrament in both kinds to the laity, and in German. And in January 1522, he married. His headlong zeal led him to do whatever he came to believe right at once and arbitrarily. But he soon outran Luther, and one of his great mistakes was in putting the Old Testament on the same footing as the New. On January 24, 1522, Karl Stott obtained the adoption of a new church constitution at Wittenberg, which is of interest only as the first Protestant organization of the Reformation. Close quote. There were present at this time in Wittenberg certain fanatical teachers who, from the town whence they came, were called quote, the prophets of Zwickau. Close quote. They brought Karl Stott for a time so far under their influence that he concluded academical degrees to be sinful, and that, as the inspiration of the Spirit was sufficient, there was no need of human learning. He therefore advised the students of the university to return to their homes. That institution was in danger of dissolution. Such was Karl Stott's course in Luther's absence. With the exception of this last movement, his acts were in themselves right, the changes made at Wittenberg during Luther's absence, whether timely or not, are generally set down in Karlstadt's account and said to have been made by him on his individual responsibility and in a fanatical manner. But this was quite otherwise. Dr. McLean thus states the case, quote, The reader may perhaps imagine from Dr. Mosheim's account of this matter that Karl Stott introduced these changes merely by his own authority. But this was far from being the case. The suppression of private masses, the removal of images out of the churches, the abolition of the law which imposed celibacy upon the clergy, which are the changes hinted at by our historian as rash and perilous, were effected by Karl Stott in conjunction with Bugenhagius, Melanchthon, Jonas Armsdorff, and others and were confirmed by the authority of the elector of Saxony, so that there is some reason to apprehend that one of the principal causes of Luther's displeasure at these changes was their being introduced in his absence, unless we suppose that he had not so far shaken off the fetters of superstition as to be sensible of the absurdity and the pernicious consequences of the use of images. Close quote. Karl Stott had given the cup to the laity of which they had long been deprived by Rome. He had set aside the worship of the consecrated bread. Dr. Sears rehearses this work of Karlstadt and then tells us what Luther did concerning it on his return. These are his words. He, Karlstadt, had so far restored the sacrament of the Lord's Supper as to distribute the wine as well as the bread to the laity. Luther, in order not to offend weak consciences, insisted on distributing the bread only, and prevailed. He, Karlstadt, rejected the practice of elevating and adoring the host. Luther allowed it, and introduced it again. The position of Karlstadt was at this time very trying. He had not received many things taught by the new teachers from Zwickau but he had publicly taught some of their fanatical ideas relative to the influence of the Spirit of God superseding the necessity of study. But in the suppression of the idolatrous services of the Romanists, he was essentially right. He had the pain to see much of this set up again. Moreover, the elector would not allow him either to preach or write upon the points wherein he differed from Luther. Daubigny states his course thus, quote, Nevertheless, he sacrificed his self-love for the sake of peace, restrained his desire to vindicate his doctrine, was reconciled at least in appearance to his colleague, Luther, and soon after resumed his studies in the university. Close quote. 
as Luther taught some doctrines which Karlstadt could not approve, he felt at last that he must speak. Dr. Sears thus writes, quote, After Karlstadt had been compelled to keep silence from 1522 to 1524, and to submit to the superior power and authority of Luther, he could contain himself no longer. He therefore left Wittenberg and established a press at Jena, through which he could, in a series of publications, give vent to his convictions so long pent up. Close quote. The principles at the foundation of their ideas of the Reformation were these. Karlstadt insisted on rejecting everything in the Catholic Church not authorized in the Bible. Luther was determined to retain everything not expressly forbidden. Dr. Sears thus states their primary differences. Quote, Karlstadt maintained that we should not in things pertaining to God regard what the multitude say or think but look simply to the word of God. Others, he adds, say that on account of the weak, we should not hasten to keep the commands of God, but wait till they become wise and strong. In regard to the ceremonies introduced into the church, he judged, as the Swiss reformers did, that all were to be rejected which had not a warrant in the Bible. He said, it is sufficiently against the Scriptures if you can find no ground for it in them. Luther asserted, on the contrary, Whatever is not against the Scriptures is for the Scriptures, and the Scriptures for it. Though Christ hath not commanded adoring of the host, so neither hath he forbidden it. Not so, said Karlstadt. We are bound to the Bible, and no one may decide after the thoughts of his own heart. Close quote. It is of interest to know what was the subject which caused the controversy between them and what was the position of each. Dr. McLean thus states the occasion of the conflict which now arose. Quote, this difference of opinion between Karlstadt and Luther concerning the Eucharist was the true cause of the violent rupture between those two eminent men, and it tended very little to the honor of the latter, for however the explication which the former gave of the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper may appear forced, yet the sentiments he entertained of that ordinance as a commemoration of Christ's death and not as a celebration of his bodily presence in consequence of a consubstantiation with the bread and wine are infinitely more rational than the doctrine of Luther which is loaded with some of the most palpable absurdities of transubstantiation. And if it be supposed that Karlstadt strained the rule of interpretation too far when he alleged that Christ pronounced the pronoun this, in the words, this is my body, pointing to his body and not to the bread, what shall we think of Luther's explaining the nonsensical doctrine of consubstantiation by the similitude of a red-hot iron, in which two elements are united, as the body of Christ is with the bread of the Eucharist. Close quote. Dr. Sears also states the occasion of this conflict in 1524. Quote, the most important difference between him and Luther, and that which most embittered the latter against him, related to the Lord's Supper. He opposed not only transubstantiation, but consubstantiation, the real presence, and the elevation and adoration of the host. Luther rejected the first, asserted the second and third, and allowed the other two. In regard to the real presence, he says, In the sacrament is the real body of Christ and the real blood of Christ, so that even the unworthy and ungodly partake of it and partake of it corporally, too, and not spiritually, as Karlstadt will have it. Close quote. That Luther was the one chiefly in error in this controversy will be acknowledged by nearly every one at the present day. Daubigny cannot refrain from censoring him. Quote, when once the question of the supper was raised, Luther threw away the proper element of the Reformation and took his stand for himself and his church on an exclusive Lutheranism. 
close quote. The controversy is thus characterized by Dr. Sears. Quote, A furious controversy ensued. Both parties exceeded the bounds of Christian propriety and moderation. Karlstadt was now in the vicinity of the Anabaptist tumults, excited by Munzer. He sympathized with them in some things, but disapproved of their disorders. Luther made the most of this. Close quote. It is evident that in this contest Luther did not gain any decisive advantage, even in the estimation of his friends. The elector of Saxony interfered and banished Karlstadt. Daubigny thus states the case. Quote, he issued orders to deprive Karlstadt of his appointments and banished him, not only from Orlemund, but from the states of the electorate. Luther had nothing to do with this sternness on the part of the prince. It was foreign to his disposition, and this he afterward proved. Karlstadt, for maintaining the doctrine now held by almost all Protestants concerning the supper, and for denying Luther's doctrine that Christ is personally present in the bread, was rendered a homeless wanderer for years. His banishment was in 1524. What followed is thus described. Quote, From this date until 1534 he wandered through Germany, pursued by the persecuting opinions of both Lutherans and Papists, and at times reduced to great straits by indigence and unpopularity. But although he always found sympathy and hospitality among the Anabaptists, yet he is evidently clear of the charge of complicity with Munzer's rebellion. Yet he was forbidden to write, his life was sometimes in danger, and he exhibits the melancholy spectacle of a man great and right in many respects, but whose rashness, ambition, and insincere zeal, together with many fanatical opinions, had put him under the well-founded but immoderate censor of both friends and foes. Such language seems quite unwarranted by the facts. There was no justice in this persecution of Karlstadt. He did for a brief time hold some fanatical ideas, but these he did not afterward maintain. The same writer speaks further in the same strain. Quote, it cannot be denied that in many respects he was apparently in advance of Luther, but his error lay in his haste to subvert and abolish the external forms and pumps before the hearts of the people, and doubtless his own, were prepared by an internal change. Biographies of him are numerous, and the Reformation no doubt owes him much of good for which he has not the credit, as it was overshadowed by the mischief he produced. Close quote. Important truth relative to the services of Karlstadt is here stated, but it is connected with intimations of evil which have no sufficient foundation in fact. Dr. Sears speaks thus of the bitter language concerning him. Quote, For three centuries, Karlstadt's moral character has been treated somewhat as Luther's would have been if only Catholic testimony had been heard. The party interested has been both witness and judge. What if we were to judge of Zwingli's Christian character by Luther's representations? The truth is, Karlstadt hardly showed a worse spirit or employed more abusive terms toward Luther than Luther did toward him. Karlstadt knew that in many things the truth was on his side, and yet in these, no less than in others, he was crushed by the civil power, which was on the side of Luther. Close quote. Daubigny speaks thus of the contest between these two men. Quote, Each turns against the error which, in his mind, seems most noxious, and in assailing it, goes, it may be, beyond the truth. But this being admitted, it is still true that both are right in the prevailing turn of their thoughts, and though ranking in different hosts, the two great teachers are nevertheless found under the same standard that of Jesus Christ, who alone is truth in the full import of that word. Close quote. 
Daubigny says of them after Karlstadt had been banished, quote, It is impossible not to feel a pain at contemplating these two men, once friends and both worthy of our esteem, thus angrily opposed. Close quote. Sometime after Karlstadt's banishment from Saxony, he visited Switzerland. Daubigny speaks of the result of his labors in that country and what Luther did toward him. Quote, his instructions soon attracted an attention nearly equal to that which had been excited by the earliest thesis put forth by Luther. Switzerland seemed almost gained over to his doctrine. Busser and Capito also appeared to adopt his views. Then it was that Luther's indignation rose to its height, and he put forth one of the most powerful but also most outrageous of his controversial writings his book Against the Celestial Prophets. Close quote. Dr. Sears also mentions the labors of Karlstadt in Switzerland and speaks of Luther's uncandid book. Quote, the work which he wrote against him, he entitled The Book Against the Celestial Prophets. This was uncandid, for the controversy related chiefly to the sacrament of the supper. In the south of Germany and in Switzerland, Karlstadt found more adherents than Luther. Banished as an Anabaptist, he was received as a Zwinglian. Close quote. Dr. McLean tells something which followed, which is worthy of the better nature of these two illustrious men. Quote, Karlstadt, after his banishment from Saxony, composed a treatise against enthusiasm in general and against the extravagant tenets and the violent proceedings of the Anabaptists in particular. This treatise was even addressed to Luther, who was so affected by it that, repenting of his unworthy treatment of Karlstadt, he pleaded his cause and obtained from the elector a permission for him to return into Saxony. After this reconciliation with Luther, he composed a treatise on the Eucharist, which breathes the most amiable spirit of moderation and humility, and having perused the writings of Zwingli, where he saw his own sentiments on that subject maintained with the greatest perspicuity and force of evidence, he repaired the second time to Zurich and thence to Basel, where he was admitted to the offices of pastor and professor of divinity, and where, after having lived in the exemplary and constant practice of every Christian virtue, he died amidst the warmest effusions of piety and resignation on the 25th of December 1541. Close quote. Of Karlstadt's scholarship and of his conscientiousness, Daubigny speaks thus quote, He was well acquainted, says Dr. Schuer, with Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and Luther acknowledged him to be his superior in learning. Endowed with great powers of mind, he sacrificed to his convictions fame, station, country, and even his bread. Close quote. His Sabbatarian character is attested by Dr. White, Lord Bishop of Eli. Quote, the same, the observance of the seventh day, likewise being revived in Luther's time by Carol Estadius, Sternbergius, and by some sectaries among the Anabaptists, hath both then and ever since been censored as Jewish and heretical. Close quote. Dr. Sears alludes to Karlstadt's observance of the seventh day, but, as is quite usual with first-day historians in such cases, does it in such a manner as to leave the fact sufficiently obscure to be passed over without notice by the general reader. He writes thus, quote, Karlstadt differed essentially from Luther in regard to the use to be made of the Old Testament. With him the law of Moses was still binding. Luther, on the contrary, had a strong aversion to what he calls a legal and Judaizing religion. Karlstadt held to the divine authority of the Sabbath from the Old Testament. Luther believed Christians were free to observe any day as a Sabbath, provided they be uniform in observing it. Close quote. We have, however, Luther's own statement respecting Karlstadt's views of the Sabbath. It is from his book, Against the Celestial Prophets, 
Quote, Indeed, if Karlstadt were to write further about the Sabbath, Sunday would have to give way, and the Sabbath, that is to say Saturday, must be kept holy. He would truly make us Jews in all things, and we should come to be circumcised, for that is true, and cannot be denied that he who deems it necessary to keep one law of Moses, and keeps it as the law of Moses, must deem all necessary, and keep them all. Close quote. The various historians who treat of the difficulty between Luther and Karlstadt speak freely of the motives of each. But of such matters it is best to speak little. The day of judgment will show the hearts of men, and we must wait till then. We may, however, freely speak of their acts, and may with propriety name the things wherein each would have benefited the other. Karlstadt's errors at Wittenberg were not because he rejected Luther's help, but because he was deprived of it by Luther's captivity. Luther's error in those things wherein Karlstadt was right were because he saw it best to reject Karlstadt's doctrine. Number one, Karlstadt's error in the removal of the images, the suppression of masses, the abolition of monastic vows or vows of celibacy, and in giving the wine as well as the bread in the supper, and in performing the service in German instead of Latin, if it was an error, was one of time rather than of doctrine. Had Luther been with him, probably all would have been deferred for some months or perhaps some years. Number two, Karlstadt would probably have been saved by Luther's presence from coming under the influence of the Zwickau prophets. As it was, he did for a brief season accept, not their teaching in general, but their doctrine that the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in believers renders human learning vain and worthless. But in both these things Karlstadt submitted to Luther's correction. Had Luther regarded Karlstadt, he would have been benefited in the following particulars. Number one, in his zeal for the doctrine of justification by faith, he would have been saved from the denial of the inspiration of the epistle of James, and would not have called it, quote, strawy or chaffy epistle, close quote. Number two, instead of exchanging transubstantiation, which is the Romish doctrine that the bread and wine of the supper become Christ's literal flesh and blood, for consubstantiation, the doctrine which he fastened upon the Lutheran Church, that Christ's flesh and blood are actually present in the bread and wine, he would have given to that church the doctrine that the bread and wine simply represent the body and blood of Christ and are used in commemoration of his sacrifice for our sins. Number three, instead of holding fast everything in the Romish church not expressly forbidden in the Bible, he would have laid all aside which had not the actual sanction of that holy book. Number four, instead of the Catholic festival of Sunday, he would have observed and transmitted to the Protestant church the ancient Sabbath of the Lord. Karl Stott needed Luther's help, and he accepted it. Did not Luther also need that of Karl Stott? Is it not time that Karl Stott should be vindicated from the great obloquy thrown upon him by the prevailing party? And would not this have been done long since had not Karlstadt been a decided Sabbatarian?' 